Uh, thank you, Cecil, and uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming here today for what I'm sure will be an interesting and engaging discussion on Brexit and the seafood sector. I'm delighted to see such a strong turnout, which I think reflects the fact that we are still faced with a very large degree of uncertainty as to what exactly the future holds in the context of Brexit. It's now almost two years to the day since the UK referendum. At the end of March next year, the UK are due to formally leave the European Union. Obviously, there is much uncertainty remaining as to, what, as to exactly what that will mean in practice. And there has been much commentary about the fact that the UK government itself remains unclear as to what exactly it wants. This government's position and that of the European Union 27 has been clear and consistent from the beginning. We regret the choice that our friends in the United Kingdom have made, but we fully respect that decision. For the future, we want to have as close a relationship with the UK as possible across all sectors. For us, the high-level negotiation priorities are clear. This is about our citizens, our economy, including the marine economy, the seafood sector, it's about Northern Ireland and indeed the future of the European Union itself. We are and will remain a strong and committed member of the European Union. While we may remain unclear about aspects of the United Kingdom's position, we can have no doubt as to the EU position and its support for Ireland. This time last year, I referred to the Irish Shannockle, or proverb, Ni Nartka Curla Kela, together we are stronger. I was delighted to see the President of the European Council, Donald Tusk, use the same phrase during his visit to Ireland last year, and just last week, Michel Barnier also used it during his visit to Dublin with Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker. The truth of that Yanukel is abundantly clear in the unwavering solidarity shown to Ireland by all our European Union partners, and is particularly true when it comes to fisheries. The unity of the fishing member states and the fishing industry in terms of protecting our common interests are clear and unwavering. Over the past two years, I've had numerous bilateral meetings with all my ministerial fisheries colleagues across the European Union, but especially those from the group of eight member states whose fisheries are most impacted by the United Kingdom's withdrawal from the European Union. In all of those discussions, it has been clear that we are in full agreement when it comes to our collective determination to ensure that our existing rights and entitlements are fully protect protected into the future. My ongoing engagement with Michel Barnier and the task force, in close collaboration with the Tarnished Simon Coveney, who has a obviously deep understanding of the seafood sector, has continued. My officials are in regular contact with both the task force and the fisheries experts in DG Mare, represented here today by our good friend and colleague, Eust Pardy Cooper. The results of this engagement are evident in the outcome of the negotiations, which ensured that fisheries were protected in the texts of the transitional arrangements and the guidelines for the future relationship. I'll come back to those two issues in a moment. It is important also to point out the sterling work being carried out by the European Fisheries Alliance to highlight fisheries concerns to national governments and European Union institutions. This alliance embodies the spirit of the European Union and is a perfect example of what can be gained by working with our European counterparts to achieve a shared goal. The importance attached by this government to fisheries and wider seafood sector was exemplified earlier this year when I organised a meeting between the fishing industry representatives with Antishak Leo Vradkar and the Tarnishta Simon Coveney and myself. The Taoiseach emphasised at that meeting yet again that fisheries and the seafood sector are key priorities for this government. Michel Barnier gave the same message on behalf of the EU27 when he met with the industry last month. In the earlier part of this year, there were two significant developments in the negotiations with regard to the seafood sector. The first of these is with respect to what happens in the transition period envisaged in the withdrawal agreement. In overall terms, essentially the status quo will continue to apply other than the fact that the UK will no longer participate 
in European Union decision-making bodies. For fisheries, this means that the common fisheries policy will continue to apply to the UK in every respect throughout the transition period. In other words, there can be no change whatsoever to the existing arrangements on access to fishing grounds or quota shares during the transition period. This then raises a question that is dealt with in the second significant negotiation development, what happens after the transition period? The United Kingdom position today is that it will be an independent coastal state and will negotiate with the European Union on access and quota share issues. As I've already said, Ireland wants the closest possible relationship with the European Union and the United Kingdom post-Brexit. At the moment, the negotiation guidelines for a future relationship envisage a free trade agreement only. In that overall context, the guidelines explicitly state, and I quote, that reciprocal access to waters and resources should be maintained, end quote. To put it plainly, the European Union 27 position is that any attempt to restrict access to fishing grounds or any unilateral moves on quotas detrimental to the European Union 27 interests would jeopardise an agreement on a future relationship. To borrow a well-worn phrase, the United Kingdom will not be able to have its cake and eat it. The European Union 27 have linked fisheries directly to agreement on the overall future relationship, not just trade in seafood products, as some con commentators seem to think. This has been, and will continue to be, the consistent position of both industry and a group of eight member states. It is therefore reassuring to see it set down unequivocally in the formal negotiating position of the European Union 27. That's the good news. However, I'm not under any illusions about the complexity of Brexit. Both the transition arrangements and the guidelines for the future are subject to overall agreement between the European Union 27 and the United Kingdom. This will require agreement of the legal text on the withdrawal and a political statement about the future relationship. The European Council guidelines in March stated that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed and that negotiations can only progress as long as all commitments undertaken so far are respected in full. Based on the, on the negotiations between the United Kingdom and the Commission Task Force over the past few weeks, Mr Barnier will make an assessment of progress to the European Council for consideration by the Taoiseach and his counterparts at their meeting today. Everything, including all elements of the withdrawal agreement and a framework for the future relationship, must be concluded by October. This is to allow sufficient time for the text to be considered by both the European and the United Kingdom parliaments. Having regard for the slow rate of progress on many outstanding issues, and while it is an outcome that nobody wants, we have to allow for the possibility of no agreement. The government as a whole is continuing to prepare for all eventualities. We've already taken important steps to prepare our economy, including the action plans for jobs 2018, our trade and investment strategy, and Project Ireland 2040. In January, in conjunction with the Department of Business, Enterprise and Innovation, I launched a Brexit loan scheme worth 300 million, 40% of which is guaranteed for food businesses. This is another option available for small to medium seafood enterprises alongside funding available under the EMFF, which can be used to mitigate the impacts of Brexit. There is also a 25 million Brexit response loan scheme for the agri-food and fisheries sector and additional supports for capital investment in the food industry and board BM marketing and promotion activities all amounting to over 50 million euros in total. Just last week, I launched the results of Board BIA's Brexit Barometer for 2018, which shows clearly the work that is being done across the, se the sector by companies and small businesses to prepare and adapt for all possible outcomes. BIM has also been working closely with individual businesses to assist them in their own preparatory work, identifying knowledge gaps that need to be filled along with potential new markets that could be explored outside of the United Kingdom. The SFPA have been examining the potential regulatory impacts of the various Brexit scenarios on the seafood trade. 
The second half of our morning will focus in more detail on these market and regulatory issues. To set a context for our discussions, you will hear presentations by key voices from the European fisheries world. Pim Visser, President of the European Association of Fish Producers, and Jus Pardekoop, who leads the on Brexit in DJ Mara of the European Commission. Following these, we will have panel discussion on the key recent developments and current state of play with regard to fisheries. I, refer early, I referred earlier to the Shianokal or proverb, Ninartko Kurlekela, there is strength in unity. I would like to leave you with another appropriate bit of advice from our forebears, La Fishna Kabu, the steady hand of success. And with that thought in your minds, I will now hand you over to uh, Cecil for introduction of the other speakers. Thank you.